Hi, I'm Ted Kincaid. Uh, I'm recording this is an interview for a, an art education class that I'm taking uh, in college. Um, it's an interview with artist Graham Dane. We're both Alaskan artists. Uh, he's been doing it for much longer than I have. Um, but the assignment was to talk to an art educator and discuss the ins and outs of what it is to be an art educator. Uh, there's a lot of provocative questions. Like, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm recording this part <laughs> after I did the main interview. So I want to say, I'm curious to see what he says, but I already know what he says. So hopefully you're curious to, to hear about it. Um, afterwards, I'll give you my take on uh, what, uh, my take on our conversation that we had. Uh, we both have uh, some experience with art education, uh, as we've both done artists in the schools. Uh, he's a university professor, as well as having been a, uh, um, a substitute teacher in the K-12. So he has significantly more experience than I do, and is pretty connected to a lot of other people who also have experience as art educators. So he is definitely my senior <laughs> in experience. Um, so without further ado, Graham Dane. My name is Graham Dane. I'm a full-time studio artist, but I'm also a teaching artist, I suppose. I teach at UAA in the art department. I'm an adjunct there. I also do artists in schools when I can. And my wife and I, who's also a painter, founded the Spinard Art Camp a few years ago. So that's another week or two week thing. Um, and I guess my latest thing, I'm also a broadcaster. I have a radio show on visual art and visual culture. So art is very much, uh, I guess, the direction of everything I pretty much do. And you also uh, uh, help out with like artists in the schools, right? So what do you do for those? Um, you do a great deal of work for very little money. It's one of those things, a school contact you and they either have a project or they want you to come in and do a project work with their kids. So for instance, I'm currently at Muldoon Elementary. I started this week. I'm working with second through fifth grade and they are working on panels. So they are getting it to a certain point. I will finish those panels and then they will go up as a permanent piece within the school. But some projects, and I know you've done some artists in school schemes, some projects can be much shorter than that. But it's, um, I basically come in effectively as, if I may put it this way, an underpaid contractor to just come in and do a one-off project. But it's very enjoyable, but it's work. How would you handle a special needs students in your art class? It's a little bit on the spot. But... No, it's a very good question because we're not trained health, mental health care professionals. I had an incident recently. Um, there's not much you can do. Uh, you you can't grab the student. I mean, all, all that, okay, I won't go into specifics, but are you talking about in high school, in school or in university? Or at all levels. I, I guess like speak to your experience and like what really stands out. Are there commonalities between the different? No. With I've got three special needs classes I'll be working with at Muldoon, but they come with two to three um, teaching assistants who know the kids and can jump in and diffuse situations. And so really you hope that there'll be somebody there who knows the children. But as a teacher, you never know what to expect. Legally, I cannot be in the classroom teaching. There has to be a qualified teacher or at least a couple of TAs in there with me. And the advantage of that is they know the students, so they know what the potential boiling points or trigger points are. But um, as to how I deal with it, I have no idea until it happens. Do you feel that like the, the art lesson changes? It can do. I had an incident at UAA where it was a group activity and there was one person who was possibly on the spectrum but who definitely had some conditions which I had no idea about. But you can tell from talking to people that, anyway, lovely person, but they didn't, I didn't realize that they didn't, get the project they didn't like other people working on their project and they had a total meltdown to the point where and I ended up having to contact the care team 
and one of my students, one of my other students, contacted the police because they were so concerned about their safety. And so at that point, all you can do is write to somebody, say what happened, and then pray that those people will intervene. But I say again, I'm, I'm not a trained healthcare professional. And we get some very basic training at a UAA, but um, you end up praying a lot. Uh, so changing sub uh, changing it a little bit, um, what would you do if an art lesson didn't work so well? Pray that it's over quickly and then alter it next, the next time around. And I have had that situation happen quite a few times. It's, it's to an extent, any kind of art lesson, it's, they're always evolving. You may have a good idea in your head, but if you can't manifest itself in a lesson, you have to rewrite it. So in theory, you're always regening what you're doing. You're always reconsidering and revisiting. Otherwise it gets, it gets, don't get me wrong. I like lessons that I know work, but just because they work for two or three years, five years time, completely different crop of students, different backgrounds. So you have to be adaptable. What five things would you want your elementary students to know when they leave the classroom or middle school or high school? Um, art's not a waste of time. You can actually have a good career and a good life from art. I think uh, we should value the activity. And I think that I would like them to feel that what they do is important. There are some kids who are not good when it comes to language arts and communication, but you put a brush in their hand, everything changes. And I, I think one of the most important things is just, um, as I said, that this is something that with, you know, some luck and hard work, you can, you can, you can do forever. It wasn't quite five, but uh, it's the best I can do. <laughs> So what would you want your uh, K to 12 students to know when they leave the classroom? Most, most of the projects I do as an artist in schools, they're, they're, they're process orientated. And it's the idea that there's also an act of faith. You tell students, we're not gonna finish the project in this class, but somebody else will come in and take up the slack and they'll get it a bit further. And then somebody else will come in and finish. So it's, it's very much a group thing. And I, I think that it's important that students, um, the most important thing I can teach my students, and I think the most important thing I teach at university level, and hopefully at this level, it's, it's having confidence in their ability and realizing that arts, arts work, but it's fun. And I know that sounds incredibly trite, but you want students to enjoy themselves and you want them to want to come back and do more of it. So what I'd like my students to have when they leave a class is that kernel that this is a good subject, it's an enjoyable subject and it makes them feel good about themselves. I know that's a real kind of canned academic answer, but I do genuinely believe that. So what projects do you introduce to develop your students' uh, skills in art? Again, in the artist in schools situation, you're not really necessarily introducing new skills. You're, you hope that they have some skills. So for instance, uh, kindergarten, I, I very rarely do painting projects with kindergarten through first or second because they don't have the dexterity and they're not used to paint applications. But as I say, I just kind of introduced them as these are huge group projects. Everybody, I mean, the way I describe it is this. Most kids know what a jigsaw puzzle is. And effectively, they are producing the pieces for me to put the jigsaw together afterwards. And so if they've got some, I'd like to think that they have a greater understanding of paint application techniques, but I know I'd be kidding myself if I did. And so it, they're, they're good questions but they're really hard to answer because really you go in there, you do this thing, you leave it behind and you what you're leaving behind is you're leaving the experience of doing this and hoping that it whets their appetite to do more. But in two weeks, it's really hard to teach any kind of skill level. You can show kids how to do something, but unless they practice, 
the skill is kind of going to atrophy. So would you say that's the difference between a uh, college, a collegiate level or, or, no, or sometimes like... I get more sense out of elementary school kids than I, oh, okay. <laughs> The, the difference at, 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 I think, collegiate level is that people have opted to take those classes for whatever reason. And God bless them. Some people try their hearts out and they do really well. Other people try and they improve, but they're never going to be artists. And the hard part is how honest should one be? Should you be giving people hope? I'm a cheerleader when it comes to this kind of stuff. Sure. I can tell people what they need, where they need to make changes, and I can make suggestions. But I believe that, you know, I teach generally evening classes. So I may have put a 12-hour day in by the time I get to college, which means that they may have well have put in a 10 or 12-hour day too. So you have to make the classes enjoyable, but you have to make them stimulating. And so um, I, would, I would hope that at the end of those drawing classes, you can't teach somebody how to draw like Michelangelo in 14 weeks. Well, actually, with, with spring break, 13. But you can set them on the road that maybe they might get there in 20 or 30 years' time. So if I can teach them to have confidence in their abilities and to be prepared to make changes as necessary, I think that's the most important thing I can teach in beginning drawing. After that, it's just experiential. The more they do the better they can become. So what are your specific art curriculum goals? Maintain a stable income. Um, I, I, It's funny, I don't think about these things in these terms. Um, so I, in some ways, I'm a former elementary art school teacher. I was a long-term sub for a year, and I used to sub. and. The curriculum is something that you're not really involved with. And when you're at university, I'm an adjunct. And so I guess whatever I teach slots into a greater curriculum. But as such, my curriculum goals are just they have an understanding of the language of art and design. And they have a, they're beginning to get, um, they've got some experience with drawing materials and they can see the potential of them. But off, beyond that, I can show them that. And if you like, it's the classic, I can open the door, but I can't push them through. Please name for me three of the state standards for elementary art. Uh, Next question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, How to hold a pencil, <laughs> which end of a pencil you can draw with, and what a piece of paper looks like. <laughs> um, and then the next one might be, um, so how do the state standards impact what you teach? And they, they could be the municipality. Um, they don't. I mean, it's it's a case of I'm restricted by the amount of time I have and the materials. So um, I'm using latex paint. Well, I have to be careful because some kids may be allergic to latex. And the other thing is that latex is, if it gets on your clothes, it doesn't come off. But otherwise, as long as I'm, 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 I'm restricted really by time, by space and by budget. So artists in schools used to give you 200 bucks a week for materials, which is nothing. At least this project is 800, but I've already spent 650 bucks on materials. That's just the basics. And so when it, we have to follow code, that's the other thing. There are gonna be certain municipal codes. Um, I did, used to do a project on abstracted fish and one day a fire officer came in and looked at them and he pulled everything down. He said, because they were too close to the ceiling. Now, had the fish been hanging 15 inches below the ceiling, that's fine. But because they were hanging five inches from the ceiling, he said it was a breach of fire code. So they're the kind of restrictions that we have to deal with. Um, toxicity, danger, and whether or not we're breaching building codes. And you never know until you breach them. <laughs> uh, seems like you'd have to be an engineer before you even started otherwise right well yeah I mean the other thing is the municipal codes if you want to put a sculpture up publicly if it's 5 foot 11 and 3 quarters that's one set of codes as soon as it becomes 6 foot or higher 
is a completely different set of oh, wow. municipal codes. And these are the things they don't teach you at art school. That list is getting longer and longer as I get older. Mm. So these are the kind of things that, for me, I, I take into consideration. Oh, and availability of materials. At the moment, anything that's laminated. Um, one project I did last year, when we initially started the project, there were 60 bucks a board. And then with the whole COVID and supply issue, there were 108 bucks a board. So again, these these are the kind of restrictions that um, that I have to work with. What are some of the knowledge and skills that an art teacher needs to be effective in the classroom? Patience. Again, I, and I don't mean that as a sarcastic. I think you need to be patient and adaptability because uh, much as though I would love it if every kid picked up their brush, dips it in, did this, and worked almost in unison like some kind of hive mind, they don't. Uh, some kids have got better manipulation than others. Some kids dexterity is more advanced and they all work at different speeds and so you end up having to be adaptable because you have to this child will finish earlier than this child in which case what do you do because if you've got buckets of paint and brushes and bored kids well there's a recipe you know like like teal blue touch paper and retire you know so it's it becomes a juggling match so patience adaptability and also um just knowing what materials are going to work and what won't. I like the qualities of things like eggshell and of gloss paint, especially if it's oil-based, but you can't use those kind of things in schools. So some knowledge of so adaptability, patience, and some knowledge of experience and some knowledge of materials is pretty much for me as a teaching artist what I mean. And after that, it's <sighs> It's just um, bloody mindedness. Just you know, head down, stamina, get through it. What's your experience with using computers in art classroom? <laughs> uh, last year was the first time I actually allowed my university students to use laptops for their design projects. I used to do it all old school analog. In schools, none. I use them for presentations. So the school district is fantastic. They all have projectors. So you just stick in your HDMI cable straight up on the wall. And so you can actually, it's a lot easier to show stuff and go through stuff rather than constantly picking work up as we used to do. When it comes to the university, as I say, I, I've only just started letting my students use their tablets to work with design projects because if you have to cut and paste things physically, as opposed to just capturing them, you're learning in a completely different way. So I'm very analog in that sense, but less so than I used to be. Do you connect your art lessons to other subjects? If so, how do you do this? Do you coordinate your lessons with other teachers? No. Um, again, university the stuff is all interconnected you know one thing leads to the next to the next to the next but when it comes to schools you will i i think there used to be um when i was teaching in the school district the specialist art the art specialist gal called myrna clark fantastic girl she's still up here and she used to say that if you think of the subjects as the blocks arts the glue that binds them all together and art can deal with issues. It can bring in science, history. And I think if you're gonna put lessons together, you should bring in other subjects and how it relates to it, but it's not an illustration project. But I think art is something that does bind everything else together. And the other thing, it a lot, a lot of teachers don't realize it's the most labor intensive uh, subject there is because of all the prep, the cutting, the cleanup, but I think it's possibly one of the most, and I'm not saying this because I'm an artist, I think it's one of the most important subjects there is because you can, those kind of subjects you were talking about, if you can bring them into your class, if you can get kids to relate to, I don't know, the slave trade or to Abraham Lincoln or, or voting rights or any, it, it can even be as simple as Alaska wildlife. If you can connect 
your culture and their history through art to now, I think is a, is a huge bonus. So do you find that in your class, it just so happens to be that other classes are teaching analogous things and do you find that that has an effect? I pray that they are, okay. but I, I'll be honest again, as a, as a, as a teaching artist, these are kind of the concerns they don't I'd like I'd love to be able to lie and say oh I take but I take these things into consideration all the time mm -hmm. I don't you get to a certain point where you think um this is what I want to do <laughs> this is how it needs to get done that's it mm -hmm. and if you can tie I mean I've had I've had teachers who when I've gone in and done residencies they will tie some of their teaching into some of the stuff that we're doing in class. And I give them workshops where I'll sort of tell, or I'll hopefully show a teacher how they can use this subject or this artist, and they can talk about it and bring it into their class in other ways. But I'm not a trained educator. And somebody who kind of fell into it asked backwards, really, and just kind of ended up doing it more out of luck than design. Uh, does an art teacher play a role in assisting students as they prepare to take state standardized tests? If so, what is this role? I, dis I disagree with standardized testing anyway. And I'm sure that the art teacher does. But again, I don't know what the state standards actually are. I'm, if anything... Okay, uh, how do you feel about students pulled from your art class for tutoring or standardized testing? Um, it's going to happen. If it does, do I like it? No, I don't have much of a say in it. Um, I, I like having what I consider to be closure. It's great if students can follow a project from start to finish. But if you pull them out, they may lose one or two of the key components. But I'm completely out. That's way beyond my control. Do I like it? No, but I just if it happens, you just have to accept it. Uh, how do you respond to a school board member who claims that art doesn't belong in the school. Unfavorably. Uh, uh, well, but first of all, I basically tell them that they were talking out of their backside and that, um, and you've heard me say this before, art is fundamental to who we are as a species. As an activity, it goes back, if you believe some of the Aboriginal datings, 70 or 80,000 years. And as hunter-gatherers, despite the fact that art had no nutritional bonuses, we still made art, we still decorated things. 30,000 years ago, you have examples of abstract thought, the lion man of Holstenfell. It's a carving of a human with a lion, a cave lion's head. And so I think it's, it's fundamental to who we are as a species. And it's also the visual history of our entire history. Is art important? Yes. Yeah. It's extremely important. It, it's, it's a way of, it's communication. Uh, it's not arts and entertainment. No, I find that really offensive. It's culture and communication. But if you've got one or two kids in your school going hungry or who are homeless, yeah, at one level art is, it's frivolous. But at the same time, it's one of those things that gives people, I think, a sense of identity. It's extremely beneficial uh, for mental health. And it's, it, there are, I, I think that it's, again, it's one of the most important subjects there is. So if you want to cut it, do so at your own peril. But visual thinking, visual awareness, um, visual literacy, all these things, feedback into a kid's life and into their future in ways that we can't necessarily legislate for now. So, you know, I'm a supporter, but it's it's one of those things that um, it's hard to justify it, especially when you are dealing with things like um, Robert, the Robert Maplethorpe thing from 40 years ago. And there are still just as many of these things that come up um, was it Catalan's banana taped to a wall? It's it's not up to me to explain to a member of the school board why this works or it doesn't. I will if I have to. 
But at the same time, if, if a school board actually said that to me, I would just say that just shows your ignorance and how little, you, why you shouldn't be on the school board making these kind of ideological decisions because I should be above and beyond this kind of crap. Sadly, it isn't. Briefly describe your philosophy of art education and how you intend to get that uh, the philosophy across in your teaching. Uh, I don't really have, I suppose my philosophy is it's a serious practice. It's something that I, I it's, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to tell kids that being an artist is taking me around the world. In fact, eventually it brought me to Alaska. Um, and I think the philosophy just is it's hard work, but enjoyable and you leave something behind. And so I like to tell the kids that it's a cumulative thing. It's a group activity. They all work together, which I think is a, always a good thing to have this idea that it's the, there's no I in team kind of crap, but they will actually leave something behind at that school when they go and it could be there for decades. And it's this idea of having pride in your accomplishments. And I think art lets you, I think art is incredibly beneficial when you are angry or upset. And, you know, if you want to take it, say music, music, literally, we allow it to waft over us and take us God knows where, you know, we should be, we should be pushing kids to do the same with visual art. Can you give us a ballpark of what your budget is per year? Um, for making art with kids, 800 bucks per project, because that's what the state gives us. So therefore you work out ways to make that money. So for instance, you find out where you can get free materials. You find out what materials that are either much cheaper or free can substitute for other things. And um, so any project basically it's, so if I have five projects, it's going to be $4,000 a year, but the budget at the moment is 800 bucks per project. Is that different as an adjunct? Oh, well, as an adjunct, I have no idea what my budget is. There's a certain materials fee and uh, it's multiplied by however many students. And I use it to buy some materials to get them started. But for my teaching, I use the adjunct for the life model, which is underpaid. Um, but, um, that's something that's beyond my control. If I've got 10 students, I have less of a budget. If I've got 18, I get more of a budget. But the, I believe the art department is one of the few departments in the university that actually breaks even and makes profit. Wow, I didn't realize that. No, neither did I till quite recently. <laughs> How would you budget for your elementary or secondary art classroom? What supplies do you buy? What supplies would students have to supply? The, the school system here is, is actually very well. Um, if you go into the art room and you go into the materials closets, it's like an Aladdin's cave. It's not as good as it used to be, but it's still good compared to, say, some of the English schools I worked in. And um, really, I would like to... A school should provide everything, but except things like painted clothes. And I would like... I mean, the budget... I haven't done a school budget, art materials-wise, but... So I don't have any idea what it is, but... Really, you, if you were to do a budget, you need to work out as a teacher what projects you're going to be doing over the year, what materials you're going to need, how much of them you're going to need. Because if you're doing one type of project with grade five, but it's different from grade two, you might just need the same materials or you might. So it's I can't really answer that because I've never had to do it. But I would like to think that I think you're going to get several thousand dollars for materials. And the school district can buy in bulk, so it gets it gets pretty good price. I've, I've had a look at the school district uh, inventory, or I should say the price list, and um, they get really good deals. The kind of deals that we wouldn't get going into a store, or you don't get online from Dick Blake or other places. I'd love to have part of the student budget for have access to their uh, their warehouse and storehouse to buy materials. Brushes is always the hardest one. And of course, like kids just splat and leave them blind and so you got to replace those a lot of it. <laughs> that, <laughs> a sore subject. Uh, that, that's, that, that's the, uh, 
Yeah, that's the monster in the woodshed. <laughs> Brush um, abuse. <laughs> Nothing has like cost me uh, friends faster than brush abuse. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's like somebody asking to use your toothbrush, uh, or you know, sort of like you know, wearing your old undies. I mean, there are certain. I've got one brush that I've had since I was a student. It's the only brush, and I've literally had it for about thirty-five or forty years, and it's still in really good condition. Nobody gets to touch that, not even Linda. <laughs> So what does your ideal classroom look like? Two students per table, maybe three. So you might be a, a three by six table. Um, plenty of space, plenty of wall space with, I don't know, some kind of cork board, white cork board so you can pin work on. You want to have plenty of running water and um, that would be it. I mean, the most of the art rooms here are pretty well designed, especially in the newer schools. Otherwise, it's a nice, big, clean room with easily cleanable floors. But as long as you've got a uh, table space and you've got water, that's all you need. When we set up downstairs, um, there are no art facilities in the nave, but we still make art camp work. It's work, but you know, it's... Ideally, we'd love to have huge sinks where we can wash plenty of brushes out. The kids have got a whole order for washing their hands. And Muldoon Elementary, excuse me, it's got, it's got four sinks in the class. It's brilliant. But you know, most places may only have two, or sometimes even one. So it's facilities, basically, good facilities. How do you assess the progress of your students in art? Well, if you are literally just in for a couple of weeks, it's impossible. If you're looking at over a semester, you are looking to see how their dexterity changes. So for instance, second graders at the beginning of the year are really clumsy with scissors, but if you do enough projects with scissors, you can see that they actually learn to manipulate. So to an extent, there's a performance in dexterity, but also I think Every subject has its own specialist language. Art and design is no different. The elements and principles of design, don't ask me to quote them, I can't remember them even though I teach them. Um, but at a university level, if you can talk to a student and you're talking tonal range, value, contrast, texture, and they understand it and they're answering back at the same things, it shows me that they understand the language. And if they understand the language, they understand the concepts. So to an extent, you can teach that to school children as well. Uh, hopefully they will be able to talk to you in those kind of terms although obviously with kids it's going to be more basic what's your favorite aspect of art what's your least favorite my favorite aspect of it is making it just the pure joy of pushing pain around that's a very that's a subject that we don't talk about very much but that's kind of the worst kept secret in the painting world my least favorite aspect Dealing with people at openings. <laughs> or the least favorite question, how long did that take? <laughs> Is it really? <laughs> yeah, it's like saying, uh, well, how long is a piece of string? Uh, and what does it matter? It's just, I mean, I've got paintings that I've done in about seven or eight hours, which is fast. And I've got other paintings, including one up at Cyrano's, that I started in 2014 and I, I only finished it this year. So, you know, it's, it's just that somehow people seem to think, well, it's, it's $10,000. What, you only spent five hours doing it? Ooh, you know, well, what does it matter? It, it's just, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, that's my least favorite aspect is, is talking about my work and openings. If I didn't have to go to my own openings, I wouldn't. And I don't even drink anymore, so I don't even get to enjoy them through alcohol. I get the full non-alcoholic experience. What level of students do you enjoy teaching the most? What level is least enjoyable? I would say probably, I mean, I like elementary school. I would say probably um, third through about fifth. But kindergarten through second grade is 
they're, they're, they're wonderful to work with, they're exhausting. So I would say, you know, um, elementary and university level. Everything in between. Uh, you know? I, I mean, I like high school. Uh, if you're working at high school, kids are taking it as an elective. So they actually want to be there. So at least they're more predisposed. But it's, um, and that's one of the things I like about university. Uh, people are in there because they want to be there. Uh, and uh, That's a huge help. So really it's about their enthusiasm. Well, it is, but part of your job as an educator is to develop that enthusiasm as well. And that's the tough one because some kids will take to it very quickly and others, there's that, I've done it wrong, I've done it wrong, I've done it wrong. And I, I used to joke, artists never make mistakes, they merely change their minds, which is just such a piece of crap. But it's this idea that, um, and that's where teaching kids about having confidence in their abilities. And that, that remains the same, whether it's kindergarten through university. I'm not sure if I answered the question on that one. I'm not sure if I've answered the question on any of them, actually. <laughs> Were you even here? Mm -hmm. uh, how will you get to know the names and dispositions of art students, especially when you may teach several hundred students over the course of... Teaching charts. Um, so you, we used to do assigned seats. And um, the, the difficulty with the school district here is that unless you're a middle school or a high school teacher for art, you generally have two schools, which means twice the students. And the only way you, you will get to know some kids very well, but the only other way you can do it is you literally, um, it's just you put them in where they sit down. That's their place, which again, I hate, but at least you can refer to a teaching plot chart and say, hey, Charlie, you know, and then Charlie will say yes. Otherwise, it's chaos. The other one is, I mean, you can make children wear name tags, but if they're handwritten, sometimes you can't even read them. So seating charts, basically. So what keeps you motivated to keep teaching art? Too old to do anything else. I enjoy it. I mean, I genuinely, seeing students start from nothing and then they have a finished product that they're incredibly proud of, or watching students at university level and you see the awakening and you see their skills develop you see that they're getting engaged and they really seem to enjoy this i i think one of my proudest moments which i also find kind of funny was remember when i used to teach art history right there was one of your compatriots i can't remember his name but he was there when you were there and i bumped into him at diamond i was coming out of the cinema and he had this job, it was a cool job. He drove the Zamboni, right? Which I thought was great. And anyway, he came up to me and he said, he said, I, I really wanted to thank you. And I said, why? He said, well, I took your art history class and I enjoyed it so much that I changed my major from computer science to painting. And that was a huge compliment. I remember saying, well, I'm really, thank you for saying that. That's, that's the, you know, I really appreciate that. In 10 years time, you might be cursing my name. But it's, it's this idea of, as you know, I love this subject. I, I, I love our history. I talk about this crap on the radio. Um, sometimes I write about it. I've got a couple of books that I'm interested in doing. If I, that, that sense of love and enjoyment, if I can instill that in my students, it's a lifelong activity. You will be constantly developing constantly learning it's nobody should sit on their laurels complacency is the death of creativity and it's just one of those things I, I tell people it's a great career it's a hard career and you may not produce your best work for 30 or 40 years but it's one hell of a ride getting there so no you know no complaints inevitably you know most of the students that you teach are not going to go into art ultimately right like they're going to become you know, like doctors or admin or whatever. So what is, what's the benefit to them as they go out into the world and do what as they do? Art, to an extent, is about critical thinking, but it's also about creativity and it's about use of imagination, critical thinking. It's, it's a huge combination. And so 
I, I teach observational drawing and looking at something and seeing something and not the same. And I think art teaches you also how to make connections between different areas of life and different subject matters. And I think it just it just feeds into that potential enthusiasm. So does it have value? Yes. Can you put a monetary side on this? No, not unless you're selling artwork. But should the bottom line be the most important thing all the time? I've, I've had periods where I've been just so freaking broke. Um, but you just keep going because it's just one of those things you love. And that's the thing. If you don't love the subject, if you think I'm going to go into art because I'm going to be rich and famous, you're in the wrong subject. It's... Linda and I have been doing, combined between us, we've been painting for about 65 years. And it's only been the last few years we've actually not had to be worried about putting gas in the car. So we're very lucky, and that's predominantly down to her. But does it have value? Yes, I think it it teaches you about other cultures. And I think it's eye-opening, potentially. Everybody loves art, apparently. Everybody loves going to galleries. Everybody loves going to museums. Great. That's a fantastic experiential thing. Now pay us, you know, but it's, I think you can, um, you can approach things. And if you are being taught how to draw from looking at things, you start looking at the world in different ways and you start picking up on different information and you start analyzing things from a slightly different perspective. And that can't be a bad thing, surely. And hopefully a doctor, doctor's gonna need to visualize certain things. So, yeah. what were some of the big surprises when you started uh, teaching art? What were some of the things that <laughs> you didn't realize that I knew less than I thought I did? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's no joke. I really, um, my first teaching job at the university was when Sean Licker was there and he got me to teach the art history. And I remember phoning Sean out, and I, this is a true, real conversation. Um, I've back, been back in the UK, I came back, there's a message on the arts machine saying, I've got some work for you. I got my visa and I said, Sean, great, I'll take it. He found me back. And I said, you know, painting, drawing. He said, no, I want you to teach my world art history classes because he knew I had an art history background. And I said, well, what period? He said, well, the first one is Paleolithic through to um, about the very beginnings of the Renaissance. And I remember saying, Sean, the only thing I know about Mesopotamia is how to spell it. And I wasn't even joking. And he said, no, you'll do fine. And so it was, um, it was boot camp. My part of the time complained, I spent all my time reading. And I had to, you know, if you're being paid to do a job, you do the job to the best. And I think the other thing was, I always felt like I shortchanged you guys. I always felt like I should have known a lot more than I did. And that's, that's, that's one of the things I love about art history. It's a huge subject. And the reason I stopped teaching was I didn't feel I could do it justice because I don't have a great command on this, say history or philosophy or economics or sociology or psychology all the and this is the you know we were going back to this idea of subjects being the building blocks and the art being in that kind of context that's exactly what it is you, you need to place works of art in context there's a there's a, a marxist art historian called Hadjan Nikolai who I've always been a big fan of and he said if you want to understand art history you have to take a painting and you have to look at it see how it travels through history and how it's affected by the historical consist constituency it finds itself in. There's a great book by um, Cynthia Saltzman. It's called The Portrait of Dr. Gashet. Best thing I've ever read in art history. She takes one painting and she looks at Van Gogh at the time, subject matter, and how it travels through history in context. But she also shows how Theo's widow, uh, Wilhelmina, I think her name was, she builds up Van Gogh's reputation through the publishing of his letter and the very careful curation of who gets the works and who doesn't and again it, it's it's brilliant in that sense so i've lost my train of thought um where were we again <laughs> <laughs> the things that you didn't realize you didn't know about um, yeah, that's, that's what we call the tangent troll um, yeah. <laughs> I, I i realized that um i probably wasn't as confident as i'd like to be and also i generally realized how little i knew but then i also look back now and think that's where everybody starts. And so um, I was literally just, Linda says she doesn't say it. 
And I, she says I made it up, but I'm pretty sure she said it once. She said, you can say anything with an English accent and it sounds intelligent. So in my American teaching career, I've always used that as an axiom. That's 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 the skeleton that I've built everything else on. That's your crutch, huh? <laughs> Basically. <laughs> cool. Well, I think that's all the questions I have for this. You're welcome. So, Hopefully, you can you can get something out of that. Again, oh, when it when it comes to the school district and the curriculum, mm, yeah, you know, I mean, they when you if you do an artist in school through the state's arts council, um, there's an application process. But we're generally not involved with that. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be somebody at the school who will write the grant. They may ask you some questions. And it's been a long time since I've done one. But they do actually ask you some of these questions. How does this relate to the wider curriculum? What other subjects are you bringing into this? And the problem is it's been 20 years since I've done any of these. Because luckily, and again, I, I do realize how fortunate I am. I have people that now come to me and say, we want you to come work in schools. And I'll say, great, you know, what do you need from me? And they say, can you give me so-and-so? And I say, sure, this is all I've got, take it. And then they fill out the grants. Mm -hmm. I'm not even involved in that side of things. All I do is I go in there and say, this is what it's going to cost. This is what we're going to need. This is what Matilda's budget should be. When are we going to do it? And this is what you'll get at the end. So... I'm very lucky that I don't have to do a lot of the admin, mm -hmm. but they are work. And uh, don't get me wrong, it can be frustrating because it's a subject that I take genuinely seriously. But you have to learn to let go because you do a lot of things without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And kids don't know that. So for many of them, it may be the first time they've ever picked up a brush. And so, you know, that sense of perfection that you're always attempting to find within your own work, you can't expect that from, from K1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, and so you can't impose your own aesthetic criteria and judgment on elementary school. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the advantages. They'll do the basics and they get all the big stuff done and the layering done and then I'll come in and I can then basically paint everything up. And that's when I'm happiest working. But it also leaves behind something behind it. And call it ego, but they are like calling cards. So if, if you know, and, and Linda will say the same thing. If you're going to put a painting out there in the world, you want it to be a good piece because it reflects back on you. And so with artists in schools, years ago, the only people doing them were basically Margaret. Hughie Lewis, myself, and Gary Miller. And we jokingly used to say that yeah, we should form our own little club, but we all did really big projects. They were, you know, because again, we wanted to work. And we were younger, 20 years younger. And we would do these huge projects that were really impressive, even if I say so myself. And it's getting to the point now with cutbacks. Schools want finished pieces of work. They want almost cheap 1%. And we kind of set that in motion but 20 years ago it was a thousand bucks a week it's still a thousand bucks a week which by inflation means that it's only about five hundred dollars right. and you're for a couple of thousand dollars you're effectively asking artists to produce a one percent that could be twenty to fifty thousand bucks and um, we do it because we one we need the money but two, you never know if if that piece is going to lead on to 1%. So it, there's, there's an element of marketing and there's an element of, of hope, or you know, maybe desperation, but it's this idea of um, it's one of the few, we are one of the few states that actually have these kind of programs. And so as an artist, at least you can do this and potentially earn an income, even if it's small and it's every so often, it's not regular, it's still good experience. It helps you improve. The things have changed. It used to be that as you did one or two, it would lead on to something else. So I think there were a couple of years um, in the early 2000s where I was doing four or five of these a year. I think I, think I did six in one year. 
but I wasn't teaching. I was teaching at the university. I actually had to do one around uh, my classes once, which was interesting. Um, but I'd, rush, I'd, I'd, I'd be at the school, rush over to the university, and I'd be plastered in my overalls, give my classes, and then run back to the school. <laughs> and they accommodated this, which was fantastic. But it's it's getting harder to do these because it's getting harder and harder to timetable them. Oh. There, they've got standards here, here. They've got inspections here, here, and here. And we get in the way, and it's it's a tremendous amount of work. It's a real impingement, and it can really disrupt some of the school routine. That's the downside. The upside is they'll get a freaking good piece of work that the kids will be really proud of. And if the kids are proud of it, hopefully the parents will be interested. And it's real positive reinforcement for the students. And, you know, it's it's not just me sort of doing that on camera. I, I genuinely believe this and call me naive because there is an element of naivety in some of that. But I choose to believe in the power and the positive aspects of the arts. So one of the things I've always enjoyed about Graham is how candid he can be. I, I hope that came across. For you, um, you know, you all, you, you kind of walk away uh, knowing that things were not sugar-coated. Um, you know, if anything, you know, maybe he turns, like, the the knob quite low uh, when it comes to uh, candy-coating things. Um, I think that uh, a lo the big takeaways, I felt, were in some ways affirmations. Um, to what you could probably imagine, you know, like some of those things could be, you know, anytime you're working with people, if you're an artist, like any, or a creative, anytime you're working with somebody, uh, or other people, you know, you're going to be, there's a certain amount of acceptance and patience. I think like he, he kind of, uh, discussed actually, I think a few times, uh, especially patience where, and, and a lack of ego, you know, like when you really have to accept that, you know, somebody else's process, somebody else's vision uh, and it seems like that's, um, that's easy, but if you've ever worked with other people, you know, you know that there's a lot of compromise that has to happen. Um, because I think that we often get caught up in like what we imagine, you know, like success is going to look like. Um, but it's, we're not the only ones that are going to dictate that. So that's, that's very important. I think for, for an artist, um, as well as a teacher, oops, got a kitty here. Um, so that's important for an artist as well as a teacher to to consider. Um, projects are not going to always go the way they're intended. Um, just from my own personal experience, uh, having done the artists in the schools, I definitely remember a few projects. And this kind of goes to the, the, the question uh, that we posed to him, which was, uh, what happens when a lesson doesn't go well? Um, and I think that that's, you know, when working with people, you know, you have that idea, you have that expectation. And when things go in a different direction, um, you have to be flexible. You have to understand, you know, like where things are. Uh, though success might not look the way you wanted it to, how are, what are the different avenues, what are the different paths you can take to get to something that is acceptable, um, if not entirely successful? Um, so I guess having like a flexibility is really important, uh, to which Graham discussed as well. Uh, some of the takeaways that I didn't quite initially realize were, you know, I've, I've worked with uh, uh, as an individual support service provider uh, for people with disabilities. Um, and I hadn't really connected that, you know, like it isn't necessarily their skill level. And I was really kind of surprised that Graham didn't address skill level uh, more. You know, his focus was more on um, the interpersonal and the social, uh, dynamics that, uh, that might catch him off guard or catch the others off guard. So as he was referring to somebody in his university class that, uh, was triggered in an instance, I don't think he gave us a, a very detailed specific, but it was, you know, so that, that was, that was kind of a, a moment where I didn't, I didn't expect that. Um, you know, I was kind of looking for how could you handle somebody who had a remedial skill set or, or, you know, like a, a non-traditional skill set, perhaps, or uh, a divergent skill set. But that didn't seem to be as much of an issue for him. Um, 
and perhaps that's just like a sign of the professional level of, of flexibility that he's adapted over the, the decades doing it. Um, that was kind of interesting. I, I think that also, um, you know, anybody who has had to work within a budget, you know, like he, he addressed that where it's not so much, uh, you know, like having to work within your, your constraints. Um, and he's also always been like a very creative person when it comes to use of materials and finding alternate sources for materials. So if you, uh, I think he alluded to in the conversation about, um, you know, finding things that were, that were cheaper or finding discounts, um, buying in bulk that the, uh, that the, the school district is able to get things a lot cheaper than otherwise. And I think that he didn't discuss this, but I think he was also look at talking about like how this is probably a conversation that we had later on about uh, finding um, donations and how oftentimes like as a, uh, an educator, you can talk to um, hardware stores or paint departments. And oftentimes they have a bunch of oops paint or, um, you know, product that's broken or they can't really sell and they're looking for a tax write-off. Uh, so having that creativity um, just in, you know, logistical sense is, is really important. Um, you know, some of us are going to become educators full-time. Some of us are not, you know, I, I see it as something that I do moonlight doing. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll take it as it comes, but I think that just having that, that knowledge that there's outside sources when your budget gets tight is uh, incredibly important, incredibly important. Um, some of the other things, you know, I, I um, you know, like what, what drives him, what gets him up in the morning? I thought that was kind of interesting to hear uh, his take on, um, you know, like the, the connection between, you know, like, giving a student that um, that sense of pride and that sense of ownership uh, of their school as they put that piece of art, you know, in, in the school. Um, and that could be something from as little as, uh, you know, like a painting in the hallway for a little while to, you know, growing up to be like, we had uh, artists at residencies uh, in our school that predated me going there. But, you know, like there was like sense that, um, you know, we could tell you, you <laughs> tell that like other students over time had made those pieces and like the amount of pride, even though we, we didn't create it, you know, like I can only imagine like just the, you know, like those students, you know, seeing those permanently installed, uh, in their school probably gave them like a, a high sense of agency as well as a sense of, um, empowerment within their environment. And I think that, you know, like me as like a later generation, like um, I, I still had that sense that anything is possible when you see, you know, uh, somebody in your uh, peer, um, your age group was able to have like a permanent installation. I, I definitely remember like, the, you know, the the uh, the clay reliefs that, you know, other children had made prior to me and um, and just and marveling at that. You know, of course, I knew at the time that it was, you know, like uh, um, no Michelangelo, but still, you know, it was. It was pretty empowering. So I think like having that, but also his, the way Graham connected that to like, um, you know, his own, uh, professional, uh, professional, um, artistry, you know, saying that, you know, like the 1% for art, for those who aren't familiar, you know, this is a public arts program. And so, you know, like the state will put money into a side to, um, like 1% of a project to, to go to the arts. And so, you know, as they solicit artists, ask for uh, qualify the qualifications and uh, proposals. Um, you know, that's something that could not only are you getting paid for it, and albeit not uh, lusciously initially, like for, you know, for the artists in the schools and artist residencies, but having that in your back pocket uh, bodes well for uh, those projects that you want to do, those permanent installations that you, you want to achieve down the road. So I think that um, you know, one of the things that you know, I look to him and a bunch of other artists, um, you know, I see these, uh, it's, it's a, it's a patchwork of things that some artists have to go through in order to make it as artists. And so, um, seeing how they interconnect these things, such as, you know, artists and residencies, as well as like 1% and so on. And seeing that, like, you know, these are not individual paychecks that are on their own little Island you know, their own little existence, but rather they're interconnected. So, you know, in a way it's the, 
a resume, but in a way it's, you know, it's, it's saying like, Hey, did you like what I did for you here? You know, I can do more of that. Um, and which could also be get, you know, like more artists and residencies if, uh, you know, the, the education process is what really matters. Um, and, or it could be, you know, the creation of art. Um, and of course we're complicated creatures. So naturally it's not going to be just like one or the other. You're going to have interest in all of those potentially. So, so that was really interesting. Um, I've always been fascinated by that. Uh, you know, I think like, as we consider what it is to be an artist, um, you know, most of us kind of walk into it thinking, you know, I'm going to produce, you know, this type of like printmaking or photography or, or painting. And, um, you know, I'm just going to do that and I'm going to do it all the time. And, you know, like that's how I'm going to make my, uh, existence on this planet. Um, but, uh, it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, you know, I think that one of the conversations that he and I had afterwards, um, you know, the, sadly the best conversations are sometimes in the parking lot. Um, is just the, you know, like how few artists go to become, you know, like standalone artists, like get paid for their art production, uh, you know, in a, in a vacuum. Um, and so it really does take a lot of creativity for a lot of us to, to make it. And a lot of artists end up not being artists. And I think like, uh, he was saying that in the UK, you know, like, I think it's like one in 10, uh, quit making art after the first, I think like five years or something. I'm completely botching that I'm sure, but, um, so that's, that's, that's interesting. And that's not to say that like, you know, we're not going to make it, but it is to say that, um, it takes more than just a desire. It takes a lot of ingenuity, creativity and stick with itness. Um, but, you know, I think like, you know, his, his outro was very apt, you know, to say that, you know, there's, there are times when he, um, and his partner, you know, like scraped to get gas in the car. But, you know, like it, it took years later down the road to get to the point where, you know, like art paid for their bills. Like now he, he's, they live comfortably enough to where, you know, they, they don't have to worry about that. Um, and, you know, like that was also another conversation that we had uh, prior to the interview um, was that a lot of the artists don't become well known um, until, you know, like their 40s and 50s. Um, you know, there are exceptions, of course, like, you know, one of my heroes is Basquiat. He burned brightest in his twenties. Unfortunately, he didn't live past his twenties, but, um, so like looking at it, like, you know, how can you, um, make it elsewhere while still doing the things that you love if education is not the thing that you want to do? Um, yeah, that's, that's something for all of us to consider. Like, how do we want the the aspects of our life to do, unfold. Um, so I think that that level of, of uh, ingenuity um, is always fascinating to me. So um, as an art educator, as a potential art educator going forward, uh, specifically, I think that the thing to take away from it is a lot of tolerance, a lot of cleanup, uh, and a lot of uh, a lot of ingenuity when it comes to keeping people interested, keeping people impassioned, um, and reminding yourself that it isn't necessarily always about the art for the student, but the skills that one learns along, uh, along with that. And so, as he said, you know, critical thinking, um, and creativity is immensely important. Uh, something that, you know, I've, I've heard, uh, that, you know, one of the, uh, the little known side effects of a, a, a collegiate or a college degree is that, you know, like employers look for, um, you know, when they're screening people is that a college degree helps you think analytically, helps you think critically. And, uh, you know, these are these individual skills though, you know, like maybe you have a liberal arts degree and you let, you know, you're going in to become, you know, like, a admin assistant, you know, maybe that liberal arts degree isn't immediately appropriate. However, you know, it shows that you have the, the stick with itness to, to see it through as well as like the critical thinking aspect. Um, and I, th I think that's a valuable signal for a lot of people. And I think that, um, you know, when he points out that art is, is a very a good avenue for that, um, you know, like when you're producing art, you know, there are guidelines to some degree but it's not as fine tuned. It's not as black and white, so to speak, as 
a lot of other things. If you're going for an engineering degree, there's ways that you create a bridge, you know, like there's ways that you create, you know, an engine, um, you know, there's a lot of creativity here and there, but you know, it's, it, there's a finite box. Whereas like when you're creating art, that box is a lot bigger and the, uh, the tools to create are a lot more vast. Um, so the, the ability to think critically in, a, in, uh, in a very big sandbox, uh, is something that is immensely valuable in society in general. Uh, so remember that as you go forward, that, you know, the things that we're producing aren't necessarily artist, although it can be, um, as he pointed out with the story of the, uh, uh, the student that dropped computer science for, for painting, um, you know, maybe it's just that we're creating a series of very connected, very interested and very engaged people who will, uh, be the innovators of tomorrow. So yeah, a lot to ponder. What did you think?